that woke us all up. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock on this Interdependence Day weekend. Wonderful to have you all here. Uh, I'm the Reverend Ned White, Interim Senior Minister here at the congregation, serving with Jennifer Brower, uh, Reverend Jennifer Brower and the Reverend Natalie Fenimore, who is on the campus somewhere, um, and uh, Oscar Sinclair, our ministerial intern for, for four more hours. <laughs> so, uh, it, it is with very mixed feelings that, uh, that I uh, am co-officiating with Oscar at this service, and we are delighted to be um, here, to hear him preach his final sermon, and to do what we can to launch him on his career as he goes to Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, our UU Cafe will be uh, lasting from when the service is over to a half hour after that. That's the sort of general rule during the summer uh, that the UU Cafe will be a half hour after the service is over. So if you are interested in, uh, in joining us for UU Cafe, and you are most welcome to do so, if you're a first time visitor, it's uh, entirely free. Just pick up a voucher at the, the uh, guest desk of, in the lobby. But uh, we'll have about a half hour to do that. So um, just to let you know that. And today, because of um, what we are saying, uh, giving a thanks and a goodbye to Oscar, we, we have a, a spectacular sheet cake that uh, has a little inscription on it that you will want to see before you um, eat it. And um, so we'll plan to do that about 1220 if that still works for you. I'll preach fast. Yeah, yeah he'll, he'll preach fast. He'll talk so, <laughs> not too fast, so that's great. The building will be closed on Tuesday, uh, 4th of July, just to let you know that. There's a midnight run uh, that the uh, youth of the congregation will be helping out the homeless uh, in downtown Manhattan this coming uh, Friday. And there's preparation for that at 6.30. If that's something you'd like to help with, all are welcome to come by and help sort food and uh, toiletries and various things, uh, get some food ready to take down there. Uh, the services this uh, summer will be at 11 o'clock, except for July 30th. July 30th is our uh, concert Sunday. It's going to be, there's going to be a tent set up. We're going to have a reception in the beach house. It's going to be a big deal. And we wanted to get an early start on that. So on the 30th only, the service will be at 10 o'clock. The rest of the time, the services during the summer will be at 11. So just to let you know that. Uh, next week, uh, membership coordinator Ben Borton will answer the compelling question, how deadly were the seven deadly sins? So you won't want to miss that, I know. Um, so come, come here 11 o'clock next week for that. Uh, also, Ben reminded me that uh, during the summer, if you um, have questions about membership, the membership committee members will have a gold star on their name tag. So if you see someone with a gold star on their name tag, that's the person that you can ask any questions about membership here at UUCSR, and they will be happy to answer those for you. So at this point, uh, let us, in the spirit of uh, warm welcome, uh, greet one another and uh, tell people how happy it is that you are to see them here today.
You want me to hit it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We come together this morning in hope and expectation, hungry for an encounter with something greater than ourselves, seeking a reality beyond our narrow lives. Here may our eyes and ears be open to that which binds us in compassion, love, and understanding to other human beings and to the interdependent web of all living things. Here, in this hour, together. May our hearts and minds open to perceive the power and the insight which weaves together the scattered threads of our experience and helps us to know the wholeness, the fullness of which we are a part. With reverence for the possibilities within each event and experience in our lives, we kindle the flame of this chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. We invite you now to stand as you're comfortable and join in singing our opening hymn, number 207 in the gray hymnal.
you would remain arisen as you are comfortable and join with me in the words of affirmation printed in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need. This do we affirm and covenant with each other. Nothing's gonna harm you, not while I'm around. Nothing's gonna harm you, no sir, not while I'm around. Demons are prowling everywhere. gonna die. Others can desert you. Not to worry. Whistle, I'll be there. Demons will charm you with a smile for a while. But in time, nothing can harm you. Not while I'm around. Not to worry, not to worry. I may not be smart, but I ain't dumb. I can do it, put me to it, show me something I can over. gonna dare. Others can desert you. Not to worry, whistle, I'll be there. Demons will charm you with a smile for a while. But
Beautiful. Thank you. We come to that time when we celebrate our freedom and the bounty that we have been given freely. Have we been given? Let us freely give. The offering to support the programs of this congregation will be gratefully received. The ushers will please come forward. reading from the, David, by the Reverend David Horst. Early in the morning before the children are awake and while the grass is still dewy, I like to walk in my garden. It's my garden only because it shares the same plot of land my family and I inhabit. The garden does not really belong to me. I belong to it, at least for the short time I'm here. Today, I'm still in my slippers and have my first cup of coffee in hand. Much of what grows has been planted two or three homeowners ago. Some I planted since our arrival. But if they belong to anyone or anything, the plants and flowering trees I come to see and smell, viburnum, dogwood, magnolia, crab apple, belong to the sun and rain and soil. These living things are a beauty not of my making, though surely made of my desire. At the moment, the rose bushes are in full burst of red and perfume. The hydrangeas are sure to open their moppy heads as soon as the sun falls upon them. The weedy looking globe thistles are turning lovely blue and spiky. The foxglove, however, rules the garden. Its central stalk is five feet high and heavy with pink scoop shaped blossoms with charming freckles inside. I am awed by the abundance. I'd intended to walk the garden simply to observe and wonder. Ah, but there is a weed that must be pulled, a stray stem that needs to be pruned, a, a blossom drooping and fading that would be snipped. So I set down my coffee cup on the back porch, grab a small pail, and go to work. I end up with muddy hands, wet slippers, and a pail full of weeds and trimmings. Why can't I simply observe and wonder? Won't the beauty of my small garden world survive without me? I step back to the porch to retrieve my coffee, now cold, stamp the dew off my slippers, and take one look back at the garden before I return into the house. The garden is no more beautiful now than when I first arrived. 
My weed pulling, pruning, and snipping haven't really improved the garden nor made that much of a difference as far as I know. It's like prayer. The words I speak don't really change anything, but I know they change me. I invite you now to come forward with concerns and celebrations, with joys and sorrows, to light candles as Nelson plays some music for us. I invite you to join with me now in a time of prayer and meditation. If you have not been up lighting a candle, I invite you to find a comfortable spot in that pew. Wiggle around a little bit. You have not had a chance to move. And to take a deep breath. And just to be here with each other with yourself, with the still, small voice within. There is so much held within the heart of each of us here today. Our candles that have been lit represent so many needs, so many yearnings, and sorrows, 
and fears and hopes. And maybe there are some joys in there too, we hope. And there are so many candles not lit here in that box of sand, but in our hearts for things we so desperately want, things we need. There is so much that each of us carries into this space. So in this time, let us turn our energies to our own needs, but to those around us. We don't need to know what the person beside us is yearning or hoping or praying for, but we know they're carrying something. In our gathering here, we know there are those who are newly bereaved, who are dragging around with them that heavy, heavy rock of sorrow. May we help them carry that burden. May we companion and be present with them. Today we name Alan Cooperman, who was with us, who is among the newly bereaved, he and his family, and the Winkler family, they too are suffering from grief. And there are others too who maybe we won't name just now, but are known to you. Let each of us reach out and care for those who mourn. We all get our turn, you know. We think of those who are struggling with health crises today. We know there are so many of us wrestling with one thing or another, and those in our circle of kinship and friendship who are not well in body or mind or spirit. Let us give them some of our energy and attention. And in that group, we think of the UUA staff folks who were so brutally assaulted in New Orleans and the staffer who remains in difficult and critical condition. We pray for their healing, among others. We give thanks for the lifts and the joys in our life. We think of those who are expecting babies, those who are waiting on pins and needles for those babies to finish their growing and come into this world. We hold in our hearts Rosara Teresi, daughter of Palma, and her husband, Sky Smith, as they wait for their first child, Orion, to arrive. And we think of Amy and Anthony Bustamante as they wait for their children to come. May they grow healthy and strong. And today, especially, we offer prayers for Oscar Sinclair and Stacy. As these two head off from us, two years pass so fast. As they go off to Lincoln, Nebraska in their new adventure, in this new settled ministry, in this new community, may all good things come to them. They have been a blessing to have as part of our community, and they will be a blessing to the congregation in Lincoln, Nebraska. May those folks love and care for them. May Oscar's ministry there be strong and healthy and as enduring as he would like it to be. And may Oscar's ministry not be a torture to Stacy. <laughs> we expect so much of our clergy spouses. So may Stacy have all that she needs. May they be a strength and a comfort and excellent companions to each other. For all these things, and for all of the things that prompt us to grow in this life, we offer prayers. So may it be, and amen.
We are so very blessed to have such marvelous music here at Shelter Rock year-round. Today we have uh, Nelson Paget with us. We are grateful to have Nelson's uh, skills and abilities and talents with us today. He's going to be with us all summer, I understand. And we did not get Blake's name in our order of service. Blake Friedman, thank you so much for being with us to serve as our soloist for today. We look forward to having you with us again. <laughs> such gifts. Thank you. Our reading chosen for today's service comes from the Christian Bible, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Here ends our reading. I interviewed for the position of ministerial intern here at Shelter Rock late in 2014. In 2014, Stacy and I had just gotten married. Let It Go from the Disney movie Frozen had just been released. Paul Johnson had not yet announced his retirement. And Russia was in the news for hosting the Olympics. It has been a minute. It has been a minute. When I applied, I thought I was applying to a nine-month position. So uh, I, I have been here longer than I expected, and I am thankful for that time. There are two ways of writing a final sermon in a place. The, the first is to reflect back on the time that you've spent with the congregation, what's gone well, what hasn't, what conflicts you see, how you think the congregation might avoid them. I have little interest in preaching one of those sermons this morning. Because we've talked a lot in the last two months about conflict. And those in continuing leadership here have ideas that will carry forward. I have every confidence in the leadership of this congregation and in your ability to move through and with conflict. So the other sermon you can give in this situation is to just be self-indulgent, which I've done. I am happily and firmly Unitarian Universalist, but I miss the challenge of preaching from scripture, of diving into a holy text and finding new ways to see it. 
So I know Reverend Johnson preached last year on the parable of the sower, but I thought I would take a swing at it this morning. I do want to start out. I, I heard something new as Jennifer was reading it right now. There are many miracles uh, attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, but one that I've never recognized as a miracle is the fact that he, he preaches that parable standing in a boat. I have nearly set myself on fire in a normal chancel off of a chalice. I cannot imagine the strength of will and coordination it would take to go out in a boat in front of a crowd and attempt to preach. But that's not the point of the story. Parables are symbolic stories. Each element stands in for something else. And the, the Gospel of Matthew makes this crystal clear. After the reading of the parable, the apostles asked Jesus what it meant. And he tells it again with footnotes. He says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what is sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word but cares, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold. So in this parable, the seeds are people who hear the good news and react to it in different ways, are in different contexts. Some land on hard stones, some in briars, some on shallow earth. Only a few land on good soil and grow. This, scripture says, is like those who have heard and understand the gospel. This is what's important, but, but that is not, in my experience, what building religious community looks like. Folks don't just have the luck to land in good soil. Good soil, for the most part, doesn't just happen by accident. While it is not apparent from my time in the Bronx, I have spent most of my life in the vicinity of things that grow. And if there is one overriding lesson from 25 years of gardening, it's that good soil doesn't happen by accident. Seeds must be tended to. Good earth must be cultivated. My grandfather, Jack Sinclair, came home from the war and did two things. He went to Michigan State's agriculture school on the GI Bill, and he married Maxine Finkbeiner on a blind date. I knew my grandma Maxine as an elementary school teacher and Grandpa Jack as a fruit farmer in southwest Michigan. When I was 10, Grandpa started putting me to work. When we visited, I would usually spend an afternoon transplanting seedlings, moving them from one tray to another, carefully, carefully, carefully. Little apple seedlings would eventually be grafted, be planted in an orchard, but they started out in the greenhouse behind Grandpa's house. Tall tales of wandering Johnny apple seeds aside, it takes more than just planting a seed to cultivate an apple tree. At the end of an afternoon in the greenhouse, Grandpa would usually call me aside, call me squirt, slip a few dollars into my pocket. That greenhouse was one of the first lived experiences I had of the the intergenerational parts of life. My grandfather cared for trees that were planted before he started working at Hillside. The trees that I helped grow 25 years ago 
are probably still productive, even though both Grandpa and I have long since moved on. Cultivation extends through generations. It helps to connect them. Years after that, I was a, a Peace Corps volunteer in Lesotho, as you've heard at length in the last two years. The ground in that part of Africa doesn't grow much. Lesotho is basically a mountain range, and whether or not there were once forests, there are none now. What little fertile soil there is each year washes down canyons quickly in the rainy season. What does grow well enough to survive on is field corn. Virtually all the households in my village were subsistence farmers. The staple crop there, the staple food there, is a ground cornmeal boiled until it's a hard porridge. They call it papa. And you can live on papa. Though a, a diet of ground cornmeal is neither nutritionally complete or gastronomically interesting, most families would try instead to serve papa and morojo, uh, corn porridge and vegetables, spinach, chard, carrots. They don't grow well in the soil. So folks would build keyhole gardens. Keyhole gardens get their name from their shape. When you look at them from above, they're round. They're about as high as this pulpit, raised up, circular, with uh, indentation in the side to walk into and pour water into. The, gardening, or the garden is so high for two reasons. First, Lesotho is and was in the throes of an HIV epidemic. So gardening is often done by the very old or the very ill, folks for whom bending down to garden is difficult. Second, and critically, they are built in layers of soil, yucca, wood ash, call it organic fertilizer. This allows good soil to form and in a way that won't be washed away in the rainy season. Vegetables grow well in keyhole gardens. For families that built them, it was a supplement to subsistence. They are the difference between survival and flourishing. I built a, a keyhole garden after I came home with my father, we followed the directions that I had written down from where I had just been. We built a frame out of edging stones, put in four feet of layered soil, wood ash, bagged organic fertilizer from Lowe's. We planted tomatoes, and by the end of the summer, the tomato plants had grown taller than I was. I couldn't reach up to pick the tomatoes. So a design built to respond to the needs of one place does not always work when you transport it. It will react differently when you move it. My folks bought a plot of land a few years back, just a, a few miles out of town. Dad, uh, an academic, has really leaned into farming at this stage in his life. He's cultivated nearly an acre he calls his garden thistle rock. He says it grows potatoes and rocks in equal measure. The soil isn't great. It takes a lot of work to tend to. It tends to be finicky with demanding plants. So dad's garden is designed with companion planting in mind. Squash and carrots grow with beans to fix the nitrogen and, and help the soil maintain itself. And each summer, a section of the garden is allowed to lie fallow, recovering from consecutive growing seasons. And so when I visit, I go out to that acre with him, working to, to dig out stones and occasionally potatoes, dodging thistles. We work and we talk and we sweat. Last time I was in town, we went to work digging ditches for another row of potatoes, and I, I finally asked, after a companionable, companionable silence, why, why are we doing this? 
we, we've, spent, we've spent three hours planting another row of potatoes. Dad, it's not like potatoes are sweet peas. They're not going to be a whole lot better than what you can get at the grocery store. And it's not exactly a cash crop, potatoes in upstate New York. He paused a moment and said to tend to something, to watch it germinate, to water it as it grows, that, that is the task of life. And when you do it in a garden, you see it every day. Congregations need to be cultivated. Congregations need to be good soil. If a person walks through the doorway on Sunday morning of a congregation that has not been tended to, they will be like a, a seed landing on rocky ground. Good earth takes time and effort. And what does that look like? Is intergenerational work, work that starts before any of us were here at this congregation that will continue long after we've left. And there are things that are unique to each congregation, that are unique to each garden, that if you try and take them to another congregation, it will not work. And there are some things that will always work. Zucchini will always grow. <laughs> People involved in leading the congregation have companions that, that complement each other. And we have to allow volunteers to step back, to rest and recharge for the next growing season. And yes, the work of congregational life has in it a lot of organic fertilizer. And you can't fake this. You, you, there aren't any shortcuts to cultivation. Stacy, on the, on the first day, the first time she saw my office at Shelter Rock, uh, suggested that since I don't have a window, I get a picture of a window to hang in my office. I did, and it was lovely to look at. And it did not keep me from killing three separate jade plants in a year. Windowless office aside, and it's made a, a great running gag. I've spent much of the last week reflecting on all that is good and worthwhile in this place, in my time here. I've called Shelter Rock my congregation over the last two years, but in the same way David Horst refers to his garden. Much of what grows here, he writes, had been planted two or three homeowners ago, some I've planted since my arrival. It's my garden only because it shares the same small plot of land my family and I inhabit. The garden does not really belong to me. I belong to it, at least for the short time that I'm here. You know, like Forced in his garden, I, I came here to observe and learn. Haven't been able to resist the occasional weeding, trimming, watering. I'm convinced, though, that this is not a bad thing. It may not look from day to day or year to year that anything has changed, but the accumulation of days and years of toil is what makes gardens bloom is what makes congregations bloom, what makes good soil for seeds to fall on, is the work that we are all called to do in this place. I don't have a great moral or perfect anecdote to end on. So I will simply say this. I did not come here intending to stay for two years. I thought I would spend nine months in this place, go into search, and go off and serve some small congregation in New England. 
Life does not go in the directions that we plan. And for that, I am thankful. Last month, I was called to be the next minister at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, Nebraska. It is a congregation I am excited to serve, an opportunity that I do not take lightly. And it is an opportunity that I was afforded because I have spent two years here. From you, I have learned about congregational systems, long-term planning, policy compendiums, all the tools a congregation looking to be known in the world needs. You have welcomed Stacy and I warmly, included us in the life of this place. The experience of the last two years will shape our lives together for the next 20. I speak for both of us when I say we are so, so grateful. And it is impossible not to say that this has been a difficult year in some ways in this congregation, in the world, in our lives. You have years of transition, of heartbreak, and of possibility. I will not be part of them. I am stepping back. There's a new intern coming. You will have a great relationship with the next intern. But know that I wish you all the best in what comes next. There is no congregation in our association that has done as much good in the world or has the potential to do so much going forward. I know that this place will continue to be the beacon that it has been. I know that you each will continue to cultivate this place and each other. And I know that when the next intern, the next visitor, walks through those doors in the back, they will land in good soil. Thank you. And will you please rise as you are comfortable <laughs> and join me in singing hymn 163 in the gray hymnal for the earth forever turning.
Will you please be seated? Our closing words today are a, a poem that was handed to me by a member of this congregation a couple of days ago. Benacht by John O'Donohue. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of lost, loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, azure, blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the crock of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, May they come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind mark these words, working them around you an invisible cloak to mind your life. We go forth from this place and extinguish our chalice. Go in peace, go in love, go in kindness, go in faith. Amen.